Hello and a very warm welcome to the programme. We will not be the world's dumping ground. That was the message from Malaysia as it sent back tonnes and tonnes of plastic to Western countries recently. Has recycling been exposed as a waste of time? This is Roundtable. Good to have your company. I'm David Foster. What really happens to the bottles, the jars, the trays, the boxes that we put out into our recycling bins? Thousands of tons of it all ends up in containers to be shipped halfway across the world where, very often, recycling just doesn't happen. <laughs> It might not be overstating it to say that the global recycling system is in crisis. At the end of 2019, Malaysia sent back 150 containers of plastic waste to 13 developed nations. It's also closed down over 200 illegal recycling plants. Since 2018, China has banned imports of waste. Malaysians, like any other developing countries, have a right to clean air, clean water, sustainable resources and clean environment to live in. The two countries say that they no longer want to be dumping grounds for the world's waste. By 2025, the global waste management industry is expected to be worth $530 billion. But only 9% of new plastic produced worldwide is currently being recycled. A lot of waste is also being dumped and burnt, polluting water and air systems across Southeast Asia. With low recycling rates and environmental scandals being exposed, many are asking, what is the point of recycling? I'm very pleased to say that joining us from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, we have Heng Kia Chun, a campaigner at Greenpeace Malaysia. With me at the round table, Sharon George, an expert in environmental sustainability at Keele University, and Henry Le Fleming, plastics and circular economy specialist at the consultancy firm PwC. I'll come to you two in, in just a moment. But let's go to Heng first of all, because not only has Malaysia sent out all of these different containers, refused to take them there, but you have, I've been reading, shut down 238 illegal recycling facilities um, in the recent past. What were they doing at these recycling facilities that was illegal? What happened in Southeast Asia now, also uh, especially the imported plastic waste crisis, shows that some of the plastic waste that cannot be recycled end up in landfill or even polluting our rivers. So this is uh, it shows that recycling alone cannot fix our plastic pollution fast enough. China used to be the world dumping ground. When China imposed import ban, all these sound is uh, the plastic waste exporting country they are looking for uh, like alternative. That is why Southeast Asia countries became the next destinations. And then a lot, especially the Malaysian government also admitted that smuggling and corruptions might happen. That's why some of the plastic waste, especially contaminated plastic waste, that end up in uh, Malaysia. So there was no recycling actually going on at these sites at all? Uh, they are like they are legal plastic recycle, but at the same time, there are also a lot of illegal recycle in Malaysia. And, and how many others do you think there are? If you shut down over two hundred, are, are there many more? Uh, for example, in Malaysia, there are sixty-seven uh, plastic recycle. They have uh, approved permits to import the to, uh, also to process all this plastic waste. But at the same time, Malaysian government shut down more than two hundred illegal plastic waste uh, recycle in the country. So, so what we can see, like there's a uh, like imbalance, like there's only uh, less than six, 70 plus legal plastic recycle, but there are more than 200 illegal recycles mm. that, doesn't com that didn't comply with the regulations. Goodness me. OK, well, at least China banned it, then Malaysia's doing something about it. Is that a step in the right direction? Because this stuff has to go somewhere. Yeah, it's not just Malaysia, other countries are, are also fed up of taking waste that's just poor quality, it's, it's um, contaminated, it's just not what it says it is. So we are sending stuff away saying, oh, well, this is, this is recyclable. And, and we're saying to people, you know, put, put your recycling in this container and it gets taken away so that trust is there. And then we see, um, you know, the stuff doesn't end up where it's... But, but where, where is to. the... Um... 
there are two things here. One, one is the, the moral reprehensibility of perhaps dumping this in a, in a foreign country. Um, and, and the second point is um, the criminal side of actually sending something out of the country when you are supposed to be recycling. Yeah. I mean, who's, who's taking a look at these people who say, who've had the waste sold onto them from local authorities, who say, look, we're going to deal with it properly, and they don't? Yeah, there is a problem with uh, with waste crime, and it's it's acknowledged there's been some work in the UK trying to increase the, the budget for the Environment Agency, trying to get much better control of where waste goes and control of where those materials go. It's, and it's, it's not an easy solution. As you try and regulate to encourage more recycling, you're looking at charging more for that waste mm. so it can be recycled, and the kind of the adverse impact of that is, is, is an increase in waste crime. So some of the governments have tried to look at. I think mm. Sharon's right to pick out quality here. The, the key issue is getting good uh, single stream source of materials that have quality that can be efficiently recycled into materials for, for the economy. And if you can get the quality right, you're solving a problem, the waste problem, as well as probably the, the environmental impact of making more materials. The challenge you get is where you've got low quality problems, and yeah. as Hank was saying, a uh, shipment of low quality mixed waste that cannot easily be recycled and really can only be disposed of in landfill or incineration. This is the, the challenge, it's that quality but, issue. But, but my, my, my question is, because this is what puzzles me, is um, if your council is doing something, because they collect the waste in this country from outside my home, probably your home, if they're doing something responsible, i.e. say, look, this is recyclable, this, this is not, where does it go wrong? Okay, but well, there's there's been well since the the recycling, um, you know, the, the, all this has come to light. You know, there's been news story after news story about um, fraud in the system. So, and that's been about the trade of that waste, and it hasn't been going to where we thought it was. And there's there's so there's been a, a massive knock on of trust, and that's rippled down to the local authorities who have responsibility for that waste. And they have a, a duty of care to make sure that waste goes to where we think it does. So, if there's a doubt in that system, the knee-jerk reaction has been to just cut back on things, on the range of things that can be recycled and make it as simple as possible. So a lot of, lot of the, the routes for recycling have, have narrowed. Um, and now people are really confused about this. There's been huge changes in what can and can't be recycled. So, you know, the, I think the confusion doesn't help. And also, when you have a range of different services, that's not helpful either. So, you know, I probably have a very different recycling system to you, and, you know, that would be different in, you know, Scotland. And it, it, mm. it, it all depends on... And a lot of it depends on the cost of, like you said, the cost of that waste well, and whether people can move it on. We'll talk about um, the, the instance or the percentages of mm. recyclable material that is, is or isn't recyclable, but I want to keep um, Heng involved in this. It, it sounds from the studio discussion, and I'm sure, Heng, you're, you're very much aware of it, that nobody really knows, once it leaves those people who are supposedly responsible, where it's going to go to and how it's going to end up in, in countries like Bangladesh, uh, Malaysia, for example, previously China. Nobody really has any idea or proper control over it. OK. Yeah, we've been working closely with a local committee member in Malaysia and the local community members that were complaining about the increased risk uh, in the air pollution and water pollution caused by all this illegal uh, plastic recycle. Because like in developed country like Malaysia, Malaysia also have some capacity to deal with all this huge amount of plastic waste, especially the contaminated plastic. And, and you, when you say the, 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 the toxic nature of these materials, that is because a lot of it is burned, yes? Yes, correct. And, and what about the people who are sorting through this, trying to find the good products? What, what's it like for their health? Because uh, the, if you are an illegal recycle, you doesn't need to comply with all these uh, environmental regulations because there are so many illegal recycle that didn't comply with the regulations. That is why a lot of, they cause a lot of water and also uh, air pollution to the local committee members. It sounds like a terrible mess, doesn't it? You know, I mean, let's throw these things out here. The city of Melbourne, Australia, dumping about 45 tonnes of recyclables into landfill every day. Westminster Council, heart of government here in the UK, sending 82% of all household waste, including that put into recycling bins for incineration. The Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, 8.4% of plastic marked as recyclable is recycled. We're being sold a massive lie, aren't we? Yeah, it's huge greenwash, I think, happening. 
where things are labelled as recyclable, but if we've got no way of recycling those products. And we've got a huge problem with mixed materials as well. So we're not designing our products with that circularity in mind. We're not designing for that, where, that destination of where we're going to put this plastic at the end of its life. And that's, that's a huge thing we have to address here. We can't be just using things and then, you know, just hoping we can just ship it off and, and tick the, oh, we've done the right green thing by putting it in the recycling container. When we, I mean, the challenge here is we haven't built enough infrastructure. Yeah. So you, you, what, what we've done is we've sat back and China has said, well, we'll, we'll accept these materials yeah. as part of our, our material strategy and we want, we want more paper and we want more plastic as part of that uh, a growth story they had in the past and in in lots of western countries have sat back and relied on that mm. and we haven't taken some of the hard decisions to invest in more infrastructure and able mm. to do more of that recycling in the uk or in europe and in, in other developed countries as well and, and when you haven't got the infrastructure you end up looking for these solutions and to be honest with you it's been challenging for local governments across lots of parts of the world mm. in the past kind of seven eight nine years because since the financial crash so People don't have lots of money to, to put into these things. So we, we pick it up on the back of the, 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 these, these shipments overseas, which have been cheaper. So I agree with it, the challenge there is to get there, get the infrastructure built and get better segregation and better recycling going on you know, in the source country and not just palm it off. And I think that's mm -hmm. a problem we all, we all need to fix. And Heng, you, you were nodding, I, I suppose, in agreement with some of what Henry and Sharon were saying. Uh, I would say uh, recycling is good, but globally only 9% of the plastic waste ever produced has been recycled and then 12% has been incinerated, and the rest, uh, the rest 79% end up in natural environments. Recycling is good, but recycling alone cannot fix our global plastic pollution fast enough. Doesn't part of the solution lie with the lies that we're being told by those companies that stamp that recycling label on their products when they know full well that not all of it can be recycled? It is simply their way of getting round uh, the consciences of the consumers. Do the consumers want to pay? I mean, they're not, you know, a lot of these companies, the waste sector's not a place where you make big fortunes. The margins are not high in these large infrastructure companies that provide these services. So they're not lying to try and make money out of it. They're lying because the, the business they've got is hard. The regulations they're facing are challenging. And they're, they're looking for the low, lowest cost solution out of those things. So you, you, it, it's not... It's not a question of them simply lying and saying they don't want to do it. It's a question of are consumers going to... And if someone's put up your council tax in the UK by four or five times to, to radically transform the waste system in your borough, you know, what, your reaction might be positive, but would the reaction of those, all of the, the community in that, in that borough in London, accept that, that, that large increase in tax to pay for much higher quality waste systems? And that, mm. that's the, the, the problem we, we've got to fix to get you know, better quality infrastructure and better quality processes and to stop... The, the lies or, or the, 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 the lack of, of kind of trust that Sharon was talking about in those systems and fix those systems and make them work for people. Yeah, it's a bit like sort of, I want the roads to be clearer. Yeah, therefore, cars should come off the rail. That's every car except mine. In other words, <laughs> you want this to happen, but you're not prepared to pay yeah. a personal price for and it. And I think partly that the pricing is, is at the heart of this. Plastic is awesome. It's one of the materials that's revolutionised, you know, the food, like food packaging, the way that we can transport goods. And we use it for, for disposable things with medicine, and so it's transformed healthcare. But we are abusing this material, and we're still producing it the way that we did when we first discovered it. And we didn't know the problems with it, but we we sort of addicted to this, this, um, you know, we're reliant on it. But the, it's too cheap. You know, if we we paid a tax that that reflected its, its impact in the environment. And there was, a, the, there was some you know, financial help there to, to establish those markets that could then deal with the plastic on our own soil and not have you know, our waste just shipped off to where it's out of sight, out of mind. Let, let me ask you this question. Um, a, do you both recycle? Yes. You do yes, at I home? Do. And Heng, do you, do you recycle where you are in Malaysia if you can? Yeah? Yeah, I try, try my best to recycle. Even though it's probably a complete waste of time. It's not a waste of time. 
I mean, I, the, uh, the numbers are pretty clear. Like uh, aluminium, you're talking about primary versus recycled. You're looking at a quarter of the carbon emissions for the for the material. And even plastic, which is slightly harder and got the problems that Sharon and Hang have been talking about, you can get half the emissions to make that material if you take it from a recycled source. So it's not a waste of time. And I, I'm extremely keen to make sure everyone understands that getting the right materials in the right bin is yeah. really important. But, it, but if it's going to end up in Malaysia, probably not anymore, or, or perhaps mm. China, now they're talking Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Laos, if it's going to end up there in one great big indistinguishable lump, why are you recycling? I'm still recycling. I recycle the right things. I just need to say that because, you know, I, I think, you know, working in the sector that I do, I know perhaps more than most people, but even I'm still confused about certain things. So one of the most common questions I get is, you know, one of the things that's highly recyclable are those plastic bottles. But people are confused, do I leave the lid on? Do I leave the, leave the lid off? Because they're often a different colour or a different material. And it's those they're kind plastic, of... They're both plastic, aren't they? They're both plastic, but one's coloured and, and one is quite often a different type of plastic than that one. And so it's those... Do I take the label off? Do I have to wash things out? And, and the answer it should be yes. You need to put the, the... The higher the quality and the cleaner and the more pure the material is that's going into that waste stream, the more valuable it'll be and the easier it'll be to recycle. Um, so, but I think where people doubt then they'll just put the waste into... Am I not, perhaps, in doing so, be being as careful and as um, conscientious as, as you both probably are, mm. am I not thereby um, putting profits into um, the hands of some unscrupulous people, perhaps? Because there are... I mean, I'm going to quote... I've showed you this beforehand, you know about it. One of the UK's biggest waste firms convicted of sending used nappies and other contaminated materials to China mm. illegally. Shoes, plastic bags, human waste, toiletries, nappies, sanitary towels, all in this. A company called Biffa fined £600,000. If I read a story like that, I'm going to think, hang on, why should I make the effort? One, the old saying is one bad egg doesn't mean the whole batch is, yeah. is wrong. I, th I think the but one rotten apple can spoil one the barrel. Rotten apple can the I mean, I, I, th I, right. I mean, I think the, the, the challenge here is that, that that's poor practice. I think there's a, yeah. there's a quality issue at the back of that, and they shouldn't be doing that. And I think the, the way they've been treated by the regulator in the UK shows that. And I, yeah. I would also say that companies like Biff will also be doing lots of good recycling and lots of uh, good, good things with people's waste as well. So. The, the challenge here is to get more of the good stuff going on and get better regulation. Mm -hmm. You need better regulation on waste crime. They need to make the, the sentences tougher. There has been cases where actually gangs who deal in drugs move into waste, A, because it's profitable, and B, because the sentences are only two weeks. Yeah. So, so you've, got to, you've got to get the, the, the sentencing much tougher for waste crime um, and get a real sense of accountability in there. Mm -hmm. Hank, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but, I mean, Hank, do, do you think there needs to be some kind of global consensus on, on what to do about this and is that even remotely possible? I would say that this is a, a, a recycling is good. We should continue to increase recycling rates but at the same time this is we want to highlight that this is the, uh, the problem is the over consumptions. The solutions yeah. to over consumptions of unnecessary single-use plastic should be reductions. We should prioritise on reductions first before we talk about recycling. Sorry, Henry, I interrupted you. I was only because I could see Hank wanted to say something. Please carry on what we're saying. About, about sentences. Yeah, accountability. I mean, they need the more accountability and sentences needs to be stronger. And I think the regulation needs to work. And I think Sharon and Hang there were saying that the regulations for encouraging the right use materials is what's needed. And we've seen in France, we've seen the... The regulations there prioritise the single sources of materials in products over these mixed materials that are hard to recycle and also to, to enable light weighting, as Sang was saying, to reduce the amount of plastic. I, I think there is a challenge, to come back on what Hang was saying, is that some materials are going to need to be heavier to get the recycling rates up. So the concern about reducing materials is you reduce quality of, of a, a, a bottle, so you might find it's harder to reuse that plastic bottle more frequently because you're reducing the quality. So that some of the companies and some of the product companies have got that, that dichotomy or that challenge of, of, of you know, reducing the amount of plastic they're using. If they switch to other formats, they might have higher climate change emissions. So they, mm. they, and there's more of it as well. And there's, and, you know, if you make a heavier plastic bottle, there's more plastic. Well, that's great. If you're in a nice system where you've got deposit return schemes and all of mm. those materials are going back and being turned back into bottles, yeah. this works fine. 
And, and I think that's what, what, what will work well. But in that situation, to maximise recycling, you may find you might need to use a little bit more material than completely lightweighting it. In other solutions, as, the, the challenge there is to find alternatives that, that don't have higher environmental impacts and, and to look at ways of reducing the, the, the plastic use in, in a responsible okay, way. OK. But our headline today seems to have been plastic, but we haven't even talked about yeah. e-waste, have yeah. we? Which, when it gets up to, yeah. to China, places like Hong Kong, is enormous. The insides of computers, yeah. the insides of smartphones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I read about um, an environmental group in the United States that actually put GPS trackers into e-waste in the USA, believing it was going to be recycled there responsibly, and found it ended up in China. I mean, it, it, no matter what happens, people yeah. got to get rid of it eventually. But, but some, of the, some of the bits, or the, certainly the circuit boards, you're really looking at only two or three, well, three or four places around the world that are going to reprocess that back into the raw materials that circuit boards come from. So, so I, mean, I agree with some of it. So, some elements shouldn't be shipped. Some of it will be shipped. And Europe's famously got this place in Belgium where most of the circuit boards get recycled in Europe. So mm. the, you, you've got to be careful about the system, about trying to apply simple solutions to the global movement materials when actually you know, the, the optimum solution might involve some of that, that, tra that trading, mm. that movement, in order to make things... Um, have the best outcome. But it, it, it's agreed. It, it's a challenge, and just but, shipping it to other countries isn't... isn't E-waste is actually going to become a bigger problem a huge, than yeah, plastic. It, yeah, infinitely. And the, the, um, the, the materials that we're talking about in e-waste are so much more toxic because you've not just got plastic, you've got plastic that's got fire retardants in, and you've got plastics that, that leach. And, then, and when this stuff goes to illegal dumps and goes to the places where you have horrendous human rights issues and horrendous pollution, issues this stuff literally you know you, you people just dig a big pit shove it in there set fire to it so you have the the, the fumes and things coming off there and then they'll just sift they'll have children sifting through and collecting the metals out of that and the heavy metal poisoning and the issues that are in those places it that's just not right Can and you we do anything we, about it though this well is, this I, is i suppose where we're we hope to end yeah. up perhaps by finding some solution. Well, again, I mean, there are there are places in the UK that recycle, and they are there is there are is some R and D going on around um, the designing for reuse of components, so that the, the stuff isn't moving around so much, doesn't have to be reprocessed prematurely. You know, we've had this. Uh, um, you know, obsolescence of things. So I'm kind of thinking... But the built-in obsolescence. Yeah, yeah, an example of that is the printer. You know, how many of us have bought a printer and the cartridges, the printer cartridges for that, have, have designed for that printer? And that printer has a, has a, a shelf life once you stop buying... Sets, but, you know, those prints, the cartridges stop being made. The printer's now obsolete. And, and you know, chargers for phones have been a... You know, how many There's a move to standardise that, that yeah. is, isn't there? But what, what I'm wondering is, is, Henry was talking about tougher sentences, only two weeks at the moment. Mm. A £600,000 fine for, for what is probably the most disgusting practice I've, I've read about when it comes, comes mm. to waste. Um, is there any sense from the authorities in this country, perhaps pan-European... Um, authorities to, to, to take this on and do something serious about it? Well, I think there, there are... The, the, the local authorities are working hard to understand waste. We're, we're doing a lot around understanding waste and, and looking at designs. But there's, there's environmental crime. It's not just happening overseas. We're seeing it in this country as well with, with waste being dumped here. And, and fires, you know, the, the bottom falls out of, of the price of, of plastic and all of a sudden you have waste dumps you know, burning, and when these things burn, they, they don't burn cleanly. They're, they're an incredible environmental issue. So, you know, it is a situation that we're taking seriously on our own soil as well. And I think we can't have... At the moment, we've got this crisis where we're just producing and producing this stuff with nowhere to put it. There's no viable way. There are some routes, some really mm. good practice going on, but just not enough. And I think if we're going to keep manufacturing it, we need to have a sink for that stuff as well, somewhere for it to go. Okay. And be Henry, I'm going to get you to do the website in a minute, if, if you would, to, to round off the programme so people know what they can and can't dispose mm. of uh, responsibly. But, hang, I want to come to you to talk about Malaysia and Southeast Asia in, 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 in general. Do you think you've, you've struck a blow for uh, sensible, uh, moral-bound recycling where you are? OK, I would say so. I in current situations, uh, I, this is a problem caused by everyone, uh, including me, including you. But the real responsibility are still with the governments and also the response, uh, the corporations. So the, 
uh, corporation and government have to set clear reductions of unnecessary or this uh, single-use plastic to like reduce all these uh, problems. Henry, final word from you. Tell us about the, the website and um, where you think we're heading. Don't give up on recycling. RecycleNow.com has got a lot of great information from the UK. I'm sure most governments around the world have a good site to tell you what you can recycle and not recycle in each, country, each place you live in. And, and if you get right advice from that, that's all very well and good. But what about authorities here in the UK, pan-European authorities? Are, are they taking it seriously now? Yeah, the, there has been, for about 15 years, there's been a very stable period of regulation where they have not moved fast enough. But we've seen the EU move with the single-use plastics directive. We've seen a lot of work for the government in the UK to look at solutions in the UK as well. So I think it's a good time. There is progress. It's not as quick as we want, but we're seeing changes to that, and hopefully we'll see tougher and better regulation to create these higher quality streams of materials to kind of make the economy more circular. One more time, the website? RecycleNow.com. Thank you very much indeed, Sharon. Henry, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, all the way out there in Malaysia, we appreciate it. Um, thank you very much for watching this edition of Roundtable. Keep on recycling, but check what you can and cannot put in the bins outside. That is the message. From me, David Foster, from the Roundtable team, thank you very much for watching. We hope to have your company next time. Goodbye.